Tobias is out in the hall, Sandy Ricketts is on the panel, John Beach is on the panel, we represent the connected community and we want to welcome you back. We took um, December off for a little holiday break, recharge the batteries and spend some time with our families, but we're very grateful that you're here today and, and welcome. Uh, okay, on to today's presentation. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, parent presenters are my absolute favorite because I learn so much both from their successes and I can certainly relate to your challenges. We don't call them failures, they're just challenges and learning opportunities, right? Um, I know that they speak from experience, they've been there, they've done it, and I know that they will always be honest with me. Um, certainly Connected Community was founded because Barb and I were inspired by other parents who we met along the way at different seminars, primarily on the North Shore, and we're like, well, okay, they can do it, maybe we can do it too, and that's how this group was born. So I think um, we've tried to put together a very diverse panel with you know, a wide range of experiences so that hopefully one of them maybe you'll connect with. But even if one of them isn't a perfect match, because we know it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition with our kids, um, I think you'll be inspired by their journeys and their commitment <coughs> to you know, you know, surviving transition, getting through it, and doing the best they can for their sons and daughters. So um, quickly I'm going to introduce, it's Koppel, right? Yeah. Mickey Koppel, I always, <laughs> Mickey Koppel, Trina Bryant, Sandy Ricketts, Don Weeby, and Joan Martin. And we're going to kick it off with Mickey. Now we're going to let each panelist do their presentation fully. Um, it'll take, you know, maybe about an hour or so for them all to go through their stories. And then we'll have questions at the end. So if you can please save your questions so we make sure everybody gets through. You know, just jot them down on a piece of paper if you need to so you won't forget what you want to ask. But, you know, that's what we're going to try and do so we make sure that they all have adequate time. So does anybody have any questions before we get started about anything that's going on with CTC? Okay. Mickey, kick it off. Linda, thank you for inviting me. I'm really flattered to be here. Um, I am a parent of almost 39-year-old twin boys. I'm not that old, they are. Um, <laughs> We didn't know we were having twins, so the life of having sons with disabilities, the whole experience started as a shock. Um, I was pregnant in 1978. They didn't do ultrasound back then unless there was any complication. I wasn't big. I hadn't gained a whole lot of weight, nothing. Uh, my water broke at home during an ice storm in Cincinnati, took an ambulance to the hospital. To make a long story short, the baby wouldn't come out. And so they finally had to do a C-section, and when Zachary was born, the doctor said to me, congratulations, it's a boy. At which point the anesthesiologist standing next to me said, did you hear what he said? I said, yeah, boy. He said, no, two boys. At which twin B, Casey, tells everybody the first loving words he heard from his mother were something like, oh, shoot, but it wasn't, <laughs> oh, shoot. So that's kind of how our life started as parents of individuals with disabilities, and it has been like that ever since. As Linda said, we have lots of successes, we have lots of challenges, lots of unexpected surprises, and you learn over the years, you just kind of pull yourself together after you've said, oh, gee, now what do we have to deal with, and you move on. Um, so with that being said, both of our sons have intellectual disabilities, um, they both are on the autism spectrum. They both have attention deficit disorder. Uh, we've lived in several cities, came here when they started high school. They attended the Hoffman Estate SWEP program. I don't even know if it still exists nowadays. They left high school in 2001. Um, at that point in time, we really didn't know what we were going to do, and there were not groups like what this is and so many of the other things that Linda described that are going on. They didn't exist 18, 20 years ago. And so I commend all of you for having attended this, getting involved when you do, because each generation learns so much more and is able to do things differently than our generation. When our boys left high school, at least vocationally, the school was able to link them up with post high school programs. Um, Casey immediately went to Countryside worked in the sheltered workshop there for many, many years, and has stayed in a sheltered workshop until this past August 
when he took a job with Mariano's. So he is now currently at the Mariano's in Arlington Heights in the bakery doing dishes. It's a program that Clearbrook was able to help him find. He works with another Clearbrook client. There is a job coach there. Um, but when we talk about the positives and the negatives, we weren't sure he was going to make it through the first week. Um, being in a sheltered workshop has its pros and cons. The pros are socially he was very well connected with friends, didn't lose that socialization once he exited high school. The negatives are a lot of things are tolerated in a sheltered workshop that don't teach work skills, don't stress the importance of work. If he stayed home, he stayed home. If he didn't wear the right clothing, nobody cared. Well, now he's got this job where he has to be there Monday through Friday, 9 to 1. He has to be ready on time. He has to wear the Mariano's uniform. He has to follow their rules. And we even had a meeting yesterday because we are, there are bumps in the road. One day he didn't have his laundry done, so he wore sweatpants to work. Well, you can't wear sweatpants to Mariano's. But, you know, it's 16 years of doing things a certain way autism, you've got these routines and the rigidity, and it takes a long time to make transitions. So he's doing very well, but you know, it's always a new learning curve. Um, Zach has always been a hard worker, always has wanted to work, had jobs in the neighborhood, even in high school, cutting neighbor's grass and so on. So he has had community employment since high school that was, again, uh, Hoffman connected him with Northwest Mental Health which was at the time associated with Alexian Brothers. It was one of the vocational programs the Doors covered. And so um, he started at Baker Square for a very short time. He was with Dominic's for 16 years until they closed. He's now with Jewel. Uh, two different Dominic's, two different Jewels. So both of our sons, I want to say, have followed pretty traditional paths post high school vocationally. I think some of the other families here have um, had their sons and daughters doing things that might be quite different. For Zach, Dominic's and Jewel has been terrific. Um, he's earning some decent money. He understands the importance of work. He understands the importance of being on time and dressed and following the rules. For him, being a member of the union means a great deal. I didn't really realize it because I've encouraged him to do some other things. He goes, but if I'm a member of the union, I have to work at least four hours a day. They can't send me home, which they did with Baker Squares. I get holiday pay. I get Sunday pay. I get vacations. And we're in the process of looking into switching some of his funding so that he might even be able to take care of the 401k, things that Sherry Schneider will talk about next month, I'm sure. Um, and these are important things to him. The challenges, again, person with autism. He's been in four different grocery stores. Each manager does things differently. Zachary is very strong-willed. He thinks, thinks things need to be done a certain way. Manager doesn't want him to do them that way. It's not always easy for him to understand that what he thinks doesn't always work. So again, bumps in the road. You develop relationships with store managers. But he's been employed for 16 years, and we couldn't be happier. Um, residentially, both of our boys are not living with us. Casey's in a group home in Arlington Heights. Zachary is in his own apartment in Highland Park. Um, I will tell you that many parents talk about not wanting their sons or daughters to move out of their home because the care that they get is not the same as what a parent will do. And I can tell you that is absolutely the truth. But our feelings were that these are our only children. We don't want to be dealing with having them move during a time in our lives where our health isn't good or, God forbid, when we're not here. Zach has been living away from home now since 2004, so it's been 12, 13 years. We have spent the last 13 years helping the agency that he's with understand who he is. We as all parents kind of intuitively after all these years really know our kids. Know what they're thinking, know what they're doing. How often do we plan ahead to make sure 
a situation that we think might be challenging, is going to be a challenge and proactively do things to make sure that that situation goes smoothly. We have spent 13 years for Zach helping the agencies that he's affiliated with understand that themselves. Because I don't, it, it's gonna take a lifetime as far as I'm concerned. I'm not trying to sound negative here. It's gonna take a lifetime for un, other people to understand who our children are the way we understand them. It's also given us time to help Zachary learn what his strengths are, help him learn how to speak up for himself. In his own apartment, his dishwasher broke. He called the super himself. The electricity went out. He called ComEd. We have all these lists of phone numbers. Now, this is an individual whose reading level is probably at about a first grade level. But he's able to live independently with support. He's got the adult home-based program. He does his own cooking. He gets himself to work. He's currently working at the Jewel in Lake Forest. He takes the train to and from work every day. He manages his money. He's got a debit card. Again, this is a young man with a first grade reading level. Adding and subtracting are limited, but he has a sense of money. Um, never thought he'd be there. Never, ever thought he would be there today. I can tell you that. And we are unbelievably proud that he's able to do that. The bumps in the road, of course, are he lives in Highland Park. We live in Schomburg. Glenn Kirk is the agency that oversees his care. Um, but now that he's out on his own, they're not there every minute of the day to jump in if something happens. So when something does happen, we are far away. The other challenge we're finding with both of our boys, and I'll go into Casey in a minute, is socialization. For us, this has probably been over the last few years the biggest issue, more than the housing and the job and so on, is that both of our sons have autism. They're both very verbal. They're both very social. Casey must do every NWSRA program that's out there. Zachary does some and SSRA stuff on the North Shore. He also does stuff with them, uh, swimming and downhill skiing with NWSRA. But the social skills really impact their relationships with their peers, impact their relationships with their co-workers, impacts their relationships with people in the community. And it is an ongoing challenge to be dealing with many of these issues. Uh, the group of friends Zachary has are all kind of functioning where he is. Many of them live on their own. I think he's the only one that has autism. Um, he, as a result, they don't necessarily understand what autism is, and he doesn't necessarily pick up on social clues that they bring up. The group is constantly functioning at a junior high level, which is not kind of a great time to be living. <laughs> I mean, I remember what junior high was like. It was horrible. And many of these individuals are kind of stuck socially at that level. Many of him grown much more, as both of our sons have, to develop a great deal of independence. But socially, we seem to be stuck there. And so that is something that we are constantly having to deal with. And so you end up developing relationships, as I think you all have started to do, with the other parents of the people that your sons and daughters um, are connected with. So, but, it, but it's a bumpy road. I mean, right, you know, there's times that somebody's excluded from the group, and that could last forever because you've got the people that are the highest functioning that control everybody else. I mean, all of this stuff really happens. And so you have to deal with it as a parent. Um, Casey is living in a group home at Clearbrook. It's in Arlington Heights. He's got his own bedroom. He's with six men total. Each have their own bedroom. Didn't know any of them moving in there. Um, but because it's so close to NWSRA, he does most of his activities through NWSRA. He's very involved with his friends, and he's on Facebook, and he does FaceTime, and he's very computer literate and so on. And so his so, whole social world revolves around that. Um, is the group home perfect? Absolutely not. Um, it is a make or break situation based on who the staff is. What we have found over the years is that the best way to develop relationship with staff is to get to know them 
but to also make sure that if they've done something that's beyond the norm to make sure they get recognized. We'll send an email every once in a while to their supervisors and people even above there to say, Susie did such and such a thing, she really didn't have to. It meant the world to Casey, it meant the world to us. Just want to let you know how much we appreciate what she did. Um, it really helps. It makes all the difference in the world. And the other thing that you have to get used to is there sometimes is a lot of turnover. Casey's case, there hasn't been. But staff, as you well know, the money that comes in from the state of Illinois is really nothing to speak of. And many of these people take other jobs or could take other jobs. And so it's really important that you develop those kinds of relationships with them. Um, there's thousands of things I could tell you in detail. Um, two or three things and then I want to bring up another issue. Number one, we found out that most of what we were able to accomplish came through networking. I found out about um, housing through groups like this. We happen to be very lucky that because of community alternatives, which we had linked into in high school, went around and visited all the different sites like the mention of li visiting Little City Scillas, um, put our names on everybody's waiting list. Both our boys started out in something called community living facilities, which were non-Medicaid programs, and so it was just a matter of having an opening, filling it in with the next slot they got in that way. Um, but found out that you do most of everything because of who you know and who you meet. And over the 39 years, or almost 39 years, I have attended more meetings where I didn't know anything and had no idea whether or not I was going to learn anything when I went there. But I picked up one little tidbit of information which made a huge difference in our son's lives. At some point, Zachary ended up earning too much money and we discovered that when my husband applied for Social Security, Zachary wouldn't be eligible for benefits because of that. Through somebody at Community Alternatives who heard somebody speak from an legal or an organization that does legal aid for people with AIDS. This woman did social security work. We contacted her. She helped us appeal and through a great deal of effort on her part, we were able to get Zachary social security so now he's eligible to collect under my husband. But it was only because of something that I attended that had nothing to do with anything else that made a difference. So if I can continue to encourage you, that's the way to go forward. Um, my time is almost up. Two other things. Number one, as I, many of you may know, there is a work group that meets at the Center for Enriched Living the third Thursday of every month. I have been attending this forever. It's a, just a group of people that meet. It's parents. It's um, representatives from different agencies. I know you're there every month. It's legislators. It's school district. It's just everybody and anybody. Anybody is welcome. You go there, you introduce yourself, and there is a meeting coming up on the 19th of January. They're going to be talking about the ABLE account, which is a way for your sons and daughters to have more than $2,000 and still be able to uh, benefit from government uh, funding. And so I do have the outline of the agenda. Anybody can come. You can get yourself on their mailing list and show up when you can. So that's here. The other thing, and this has nothing to do with why we are here today, um, but I feel it is very important and I have made an effort over the years to be active politically so that I can speak up on behalf of my children and make legislators know my feelings about things. I'm sure you're all aware of the situation that took place with that young man from Crystal Lake. Um, there was a GoFund program for him. I think they've raised at least $170,000 already. I don't even know. That was the last I heard. It could even be more so. This really hit me harder than anything else because of how social both my sons are. Zachary in particular really interacts with the community speaks to anybody and befriends people. And the fact that something like this could happen has shaken me to the core. There was a letter written, an op-ed piece in the Tribune by a parent. Many of you may have seen it. If not, 
I printed that here. I think it speaks very highly about how we all feel as parents, especially of parents of children who are adults, who may be on their own, and I think it's a worthwhile read. He says exactly how my husband and I feel. But the second thing is there's also an organization called Equip for Equality, which some of you may be familiar with. I think of them as the ACLU for the disability community. And they helped Zachary get some, they, they helped us personally to help Zachary move in his own apartment. But I received an email from them yesterday in regards to the situation in Crystal Lake. And they have um, a feeling that some very significant, significant things need to be done in the state of Illinois. This email spells out the five things that they want to see happen. One of them in particular is to amend a Commission on Discrimination and Hate Crimes Act. I'm planning on contacting my state senator, Christina Castro, who was newly elected, and my state rep, Fred, uh, Fred Crespo, <laughs> present him with this information encourage him to be one of the supporters to make the amendments to the act and all the other things that Equip for Equality is recommending. I think this is a bipartisan issue. It doesn't matter if your legislators are Republicans or Democrats. I think this is something that absolutely has to take place in Illinois. More than anything else that we're doing, this cannot continue. So I do have handouts here. If there aren't enough to go around, um, Linda said she'd be able to scan it and get it to you or I can email you. But I beg of you to read this, reach out to your legislators, and speak up. We must, must speak up. Fred Crespo has said to me repeatedly, that there are many times something comes up regarding disabilities at the state level, and he gets very few emails, very few phone calls, very few, you know, drop in the office to speak on our behalf, where other issues from other uh, businesses and so on, um, he's bombarded. We need to make our voices heard on all disability issues, but this in particular. So I have these handouts here, and um, I hope you're able to help. Thank you. Uh, I'm Trina Bryant. Uh, my son, Robbie, is 24. Uh, he is on the autism spectrum. We relate to this diagnosis. Uh, when he was young, it was primarily speech, and we started in the PIE program, and it was the classic, always developmentally delayed, and, you know, he never seemed to really fit any place. Uh, um, but he wasn't, you know, he spent his whole career in special education. He attended Palatine High School, um, taking the, regu the general, I think it was a general education curriculum through the special ed, and then... Uh, they offered him a super senior year, which was just kind of a repeat of his senior year. Um, and then he went into the adult transition program for two years. Um, we wanted him to have uh, a college-like experience. And so I started attending those, um, I believe it was directions that uh, at Forest View High School that they do every fall when they bring in pro colleges and programs that offer um, programs for kids with special needs. and. It was there that I met Minnesota, a representative from Minnesota Life College, and you know we talked. And I said, "Oh, there's no way I'm sending my kid to Minnesota. No, you know I'm not. You know, this this was his junior year in high school. So, and every year I would go back there, and um, I would bring Robbie, and I'd say, you know, let's, you know, what what's clicking with you? I don't, you know, just blank, <laughs> you know, typical kid, uh, you know, what do you want to do? I don't know. So we. Um, I, I developed a list of about seven different college type programs that I thought would be possibilities and then I quickly zeroed in on uh, Minnesota Life College is really the only place I wanted him to go. Um, this, this college was founded by parents uh, who had a kid with special needs. This child is now in his early 40s. The school's been there for 20 years. Um, and, and, and Robbie met the qualifications for the school, and we, we visited, and, you know, and you, you go down the list, you know, you, they want kids who are on the autism spectrum or have learning disabilities. Um, 
that don't have major behavioral issues that can live safely. Um, there was a minimum IQ, which he was okay. Uh, and then the last qualification was the student wants to be here. <laughs> and this is this was <laughs> you're like, oh now what? <laughs> you know, do you want to go? No. What do you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> oh, this isn't helping, you know. So it, it's, it's been a, always been a challenge for him to make decisions about what he wants to do. Um, and, and it was very hard as a parent to, to push him into this program, which, you know, our gut was telling, oh, this is a phenomenal place. You've got to go. You've got to try it. Um, you know, with, he'd say no and stomp out of the room. And it's like, well, you, they had a summer program that lasted three weeks, which is kind of a sampling of what, it would be like, and we're like, well, you have to go to this, and it also gives uh, the college a chance to see what the students are like and if they would be a good fit. So he went to that, and you know, it wasn't, it was okay. It was his first time he'd ever really been away from home. Um, and then we turned around and we sent him there, and, and it was, you know, he was in the ATP program, and I had told his case manager and the psychologist, you know, this is what we want, and. They're like you're gonna you're gonna have to push him, you know. He's not gonna. And, and I really thank them for telling me that, and giving me the courage to push him and you know go away to school. Um, Minnesota Life College, they teach life skills. Their curriculum is called Real Skills for Real Life. Um, it's not academic. The kids, the students live in apartments. He is. This is he's in his third year now. Um, it's a three-year program, and the kids are in apartments with three other he's three other men and there's a three bedrooms. And he, he's been fortunate to have his own room uh, all three years. Uh, they do apartment teaching, where his apart you know they come in and tell him how to clean the apartment. They have schedules for cleaning. They cook their own meals. They plan once a week. They plan their meals. They have a budget of fifty dollars. They take the kids grocery shopping, um, and then, of the you know one night a week, each of the students will cook for the other. So they're they're forced to learn recipes and cook for the others. And then, other nights they're kind of on their own and we'll call what'd you have for dinner? Frozen meal, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So um, so that that's the apartment teaching and the independent living. They teach these kids transportation skills. When they were freshmen, they would take them a few blocks from school and have them in groups get back to school on their own. To now, they're at the point where my son can get all over Minneapolis um, on his own. You know, you know, they would have look look up things in transportation class, and they would have transportation lab where the instructor would drive them places and drop them off, and they'd have to take public transportation back to school and. Um, and it, 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 it's been amazing to me, you know, because he, he'd say, what, I go, what'd you do in transportation? Oh, we went to the airport. And then, you know, a few months later, what'd you do in transportation? We went to the airport. I'm like, oh, good, they're, you know, doing this multiple times. And then his advisor called me and said, no, he went to the airport all by himself. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> whoa, I don't think he could do that in Chicago from our house to O'Hare, you know. It was, it was just, um, it's been exciting to see um, him in a city where he can get around Easy. I mean, the school is um, in a suburb, first suburb out of, first string of suburbs out of Minneapolis. You know, there's great public transportation. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> Ooh, I'm rambling on here. So the classes, you know, besides apartment living, uh, freshman year it was like food safety, how to be safe in the kitchen. Well, it had some of that in foods. Um, they work on getting them jobs. Half their day is spent. They give them job placements. Uh, it's a lot of the same type of place things that they do in ATP here, um, which was attractive for for um, for me because I kept saying, "Oh, Robbie, you know, this is going to be like, you know, it's like ATP only it's 24/7, and you know they have they work with Walgreens and IKEA and hotels. Um, the, the the school has their own um, business where the kids make dog biscuits and, and sell them, so that's their kind of school." They, and they learn all aspects of making the biscuits and, you know, selling them at various events. Um, they have classes on stress, busting stress. Um, he's learned to manage his frustrations better. 
over the the time, you know, at the beginning of the freshman year, I'd, you know, um, I'd get these, you know, notes online. Oh, he's slamming doors and he's scared his roommates. It's like, oh, great, he's going to get kicked out, you know. No, and they, you know, they've really worked with him to channel and speak on his frustrations. Um, they have classes on relationships. Um, they have a class called 411, which is just stuff that you got to know that uh, kids on the spectrum need to be taught, um, like how to close to stand to people, um, and just getting along. The school is um, where they're located. They're right across from Best Buy headquarters, and Best Buy has been a very big sponsor of the school. and. They've even uh, invited the school to have hold, use their classrooms, and they're having their employees um, interact with the kids, which is great because their employees are learning how to interact with kids on the spectrum. Um, so that that's been the academic and the living side of it. The kids are also um, given a young young adults, I should say, um, are allowed to choose electives, and one of the electives has. They're, they have memberships to the Y, so the kids go to the Y. Um, my son is taken to improv, which is something I never would have guessed, but I've, I've been reading that it's kind of popular with kids on the spectrum, and because I would think, oh God, you know, he doesn't process well, no short-term memory. He loves improv. He's been doing it for five semesters. Um, it, it's just, it's really fun to see this independence and him developing new stuff. Um, so as I was saying, he's a senior, and Minnesota Life College has a um, what they call a community living program for kids who have completed the undergrad program, whereby they stay um, in the area and they get their own apartments. And for a fee, um, the school will like give them so much time and help them take them grocery shopping, um, arrange the social um, elements of things. And I'm going over my time here. Um, it's a phenomenal program. I could probably talk all day about it. It's, it's just been a blessing in our life to have found this program, and we have no regrets about um, sending him away to school. It's, um, it's kind of different because I, you know, when we were looking, there weren't many people who I could talk to that had sent their child to a uh, program such as this. But... Um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience for us, and we hope he stays in Minnesota, and that's where we're transitioning now, and I'm still getting the maybe, but uh, we're, we're going to push, <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully he'll adjust, and <laughs> I know he will, so anyway, um, I'm happy to talk to you more about it afterwards, and you can see his yearbooks and stuff, so. My name is Sandy Ricketts, and my daughter Catherine is 24 years old. Uh, she attended grade school in the Palatine School District in self-contained classrooms. And then when she was high school age, she tr uh, transitioned over to Kirk School in Palatine and spent seven years at uh, Kirk School. She is now at uh, a day program at the, um, it's the REACH Day program at the Center for Enriched Living in uh, River Woods. And she is attending the program five days a week and she's there from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, some background on Catherine. She does have a very significant cognitive disability. Functionally, she's probably around the four-year-old age on average, but some skills are higher, some skills are lower. She is, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, nonverbal. Non uh, she requires supervision 24-7. Can't really rely on her to, to be on her own um, safely. Um, you know, she is safe on her own, but if there were any kind of emergency, she would not be equipped to handle it. Um, she can communicate on her iPad because she has actually some decent reading skills and typing skills and stuff, but she chooses not to. Uh, she's stubborn and so she ends up communicating by gestures, which unfortunately not everybody understands. And you know, many, many years of school could not change that. Um, she does have a wonderful sense of humor, loves to laugh, loves to play practical jo jokes, will sit on her iPad and watch funny videos and just laugh and laugh and laugh. And so it's very cheerful to have her around at home um, when she's in a good mood. 
Um, she likes to travel and she loves to be in the community, uh, but she does have very, very limited social skills. She has no meaningful friendships. Um, you know, she's pretty much just her and her iPad. Um, most of the time she needs to be pushed into social um, uh, um, situations. And she does have some behavior issues. She, uh, is, she has OCD issues. She can be, you know, obstinate, uncooperative, doesn't like to be told what to do, um, and she can also be um, aggressive with her peers at times. Uh, if she gets frustrated with somebody, she may express it in a way that's not appropriate. Um, so with all that, I um, sort of settled in on trying to find a day program. I thought that would be the best fit for her. And um, I did what you guys are doing. I went to lots of information nights. I did tours. Um, the post-22 world is big, and it's scary, and it's hard to get your you know mind around it. And really, the best thing to do is to start early, start slow. Don't try to get overwhelmed too soon just learn a few things and then come back and learn a few more things. And like you, I did tours of places that probably weren't going to be appropriate, but it seemed like I always, I always learned something. So um, from that perspective, I, you know, kind of started, I really started to, to seriously self-educate about this when Catherine was about 16 years old. Um, I really didn't um, have a big interest in doing a micro business. Um, Catherine and I have a wonderful relationship but not when we're together 24-7. When we're together 24-7, we get ready to kill each other. So having a few hours apart a day was something that was very healthy for our relationship. Um, and then um, customized employment, I, I'll go into that a little bit later as to, to why I am at this time anyway, well, we didn't pursue it. So in choosing a day program, I started early. Um, that's the thing I want to, to pass on. Start early and take advantage of your school transition services because they are wonderful. And um, they're, they're, they're just you know one of the best resources you're going to have. Um, I also tried to be very observant during any day program tours I went. Often you would they would do a presentation at the start of the tour, and you loved it. They were saying everything you wanted to hear, and you're ready to sign up. And then you go out and you actually observe the, the program in action, and it'd be kind of like, uh, you know, you're not, they're not really as busy as you said they were. Or, you know, you would just kind of get a feeling like maybe this wasn't the right fit. Also, it could have been a really good program, but because of um, the behaviors of the people in the program, especially the way my daughter can act inappropriately, you know, I'd be like, oh no, I can't, you know, I can't put her in a room full of boys with autism because she just go around and yell at them all day. So, you know, I had to, I had to take into account what I knew of her too. Um, and then about seven months before her graduation, it was like, okay, now it's time. And I settled on three programs that I thought would be the best fit. And then that's when I brought the rest of my family into it. And I scheduled individualized tours, bringing along my husband, my son who was home on, on, from college, and my daughter. And we, and we you know, did a, a, a tour. And then I went ahead and, and, and um, started the application process with all three because I just wanted to get to learn them more seriously before I made a final decision. Um, one of the great things about school transition services is while they're still in school, they will send an aide with your child if they need it to the day program on a trial basis. Take advantage of that if you need it, by all means, because it's so wonderful having somebody who knows your child, especially, you know, when your child's nonverbal. You know, they know your child, they take them there, they help them through the transition for a couple of days, um, and then they come back and they give you great feedback on how it went. And, I, you know, that was by far one of the more valuable experiences. The other thing that I, that, um, I ended up doing two trial periods with two different day programs in that in the months before graduation because I also tried a, a, a sheltered workshop um, in addition to the REACH program and the, and the main reason was I was just genuinely curious as to how she would do. I knew she had the skills to do a sheltered workshop but would her behaviors interfere and there wasn't really any way to know that unless she did a trial and so I went ahead and, you know, and tried and it actually was very successful and even though I ended up choosing something different that's just very valuable information that I'm going to be you know I'm going to have and hold and be able to use in any future planning. Um, so, um, so the reason why I chose the REACH program over our other options is it has a, a, a 
pretty low ratio of instructors to participants. Um, you know, their standard is one on five. Um, they go, you know, they'll also do one on three, one on one if, if um, necessary and they have the room. Um, they also have a very, very large variety of activities. They don't just focus on vocation. They focus on vocation, they focus on recreation, they focus on life skills. Um, she is, you know, she's doing cooking classes, she's doing art, she's doing exercising, she's doing museum, museum trips, she's going to restaurants, and because of her love of going into the community and her love of just, you know, being out and about, that was a really, really good fit for her. She loves getting in a van and going someplace. And because she was engaged and happy, that was helping with her behaviors. And that's where I that's the reason why I felt like it was the best fit. Um, and you know, and getting into employment is certainly not something that's off the table. You know, um, and, this, and um, even you know, the Center for Rich Living has has an employment manager if that's something we ever want to look into in the future. Um, but I felt like the variety that the day program gave her would be a better fit than um, a single place of employment or even a couple places of employment um, or a sheltered workshop. I just felt like, you know, you know your child and that just seemed to be something that, that would fit best with her. No situation is ever perfect. I would say one of the imperfections of our day program situation is the, um, the REACH program is more expensive than um, most of the other day programs. The, the low ratio of instructors to participants, the, the you know, numerous community trips cost extra money. Um, I, we were fortunate that we did get home-based funding about six months after Catherine graduated, so that was, that was awesome. And um, the REACH program cannot accept funding directly. They're not licensed to accept funding directly, but I pay myself as her personal support worker um, and then I use that money toward um, toward the REACH program and it does you know just barely cover the cost of, of, of the program. The other imperfection is that it is far away. It's um, 14 miles from my house in Riverwoods. Fortunately the center is looking very seriously at expanding into the northwest suburbs. Hopefully that'll happen within a year. Um, uh, I'm, I'm her primary source of transportation but we do I do have available para, PACE paratransit services, and I do use them about 30% of the time. Sort of when I have an appointment or I just need some relief, um, I can use those services. And the downside of those is that sometimes they're on the bus kind of a long time. It's door-to-door -door service, but it's a shared ride, and you sometimes they're going all over the place. Um, the one thing is, uh, one idea that's worked really well for me on the PACE paratransit is I bought a GPS uh, tracker and I put it in her backpack. And so when it's time for her to be picked up by the bus, I open up my iPhone and I just watch her progress through sometimes all over the north and northwest <laughs> suburbs. But at least I know where she is and I know if it's bus is running late, I know why. And that's been a huge, from, you know, from my anxiety perspective, that's been a huge help. And fortunately, her behavior has been exceptionally well on the bus and so that's, that's worked out um, really well. Um, so, you know, in summary, start early, start slow. Please just take advantage of the services you get through the school. My name is Dawn Weavy. I have a son who's 21 years old. He came up through District 15 and then went to Palatine High School. He was diagnosed, um, we lived in Texas at the time. Um, our pediatrician just completely dismissed any of my concerns and finally took it upon myself to go to Children's Hospital and get a hearing exam. Let's start there and then from there everything took off. They said he doesn't have a hearing problem. You need to get in touch with your school district and so the transitions began. Um, he had a six-week evaluation, was diagnosed after that evaluation with classic autism, mild to moderate. I was told at the time he would never speak he would never be in a regular classroom. He will not play sports. He will blah, 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 blah. So it was very devastating. Um, we immediately went into the um, early childhood program and then supplemented speech therapy, OT, all of that privately as well. So he's doubling up on that. Um, Texas, the state of Texas has really wonderful, had really wonderful services, I don't know about today, where um, had a lot of people coming into our home um, 
ABA was brand new at the time, but they were trying to touch on some of those concepts and do ABA in the home and, and also do a lot of transition from home skills to school skills and back and forth. Um, we moved to the Chicago area when he was five, right before he started kindergarten. And so he was um, accepted into the, at the time, autism program. The name has changed a hundred times since then, so I don't even know what it was called. Um, it was the autism program at the time. Um, we, knowing him the way we did, we sort of had an upfront battle. We wanted him thrown into regular kindergarten, given the expectations of, of what regular kindergarten needed of him and then pull back when needed. The district did not want to do that. They don't do that. They want you to do it their way. Um, but we said, no, no, we don't want him transitioning every couple weeks, changing every couple weeks. We want show him this, pull back when you need to. We finally got them convinced that that was the best thing. That was wonderful. So he would go to kindergarten all day or all morning and pull back into the autism room in the afternoon for uh, goal work and individual um, speech therapy and things like that. Um, he finally started talking when we um, introduced PEX um, mm -hmm. to him, picture exchange, and um, the talking started coming. He, was in, he um, could read very early as well, um, so that was a benefit academically to him. Um, was in the autism program. Again, we just kind of fought the battle first and second grade. No, he's the first day of school each year. He's going to go into regular first grade. You're going to show him what's expected and then pull back. They did not want to do that, but we were able to put our foot down and say, no, this is what we need him to do. This is the type of child he is. It may not work for everybody or may not, but this is what works for him. So show him what's expected and then pull back if you need to. Um, that worked wonderfully for those two years. When it came time for third grade, um, we had several IEPs that spring because we were wanting him to stay in the autism pro We were told he should stay in the autism program, but because of the time limits of regular ed classroom versus the um, autism room, we had to pull back on his time in the regular classroom to 49% of his day, which he was actually in there probably 80, 85% of his day. So. Um, we finally pulled him out of the autism program and did full inclusion at his home school, which was um, a big transition for him, but he blossomed. And um, academically, he was, he was doing um, on par work um, all the way up. Oh, and he had a one-on-one -on -one aid. We then, after probably fourth grade, realized we would like to pull back on the aid if possible. Um, so that he could potentially go to junior high without an aid, but still surrounded by support. We did that very slowly, very calculated. It worked. We went to junior high, no aid, but had, um, instead of taking a foreign language, he had a sort of a resource hour with his case manager, speech therapist, things like that. That went really well. Then we transitioned to Palatine High School. And I have to say, everyone's talking about the importance of a team. You know, whether it's, you know, whoever these people are in your life, even a bus driver, you know, <laughs> these are so, it's so important to let that team know that you're their partner, you're behind them, even though you may not agree all the time, but you want them to be more accepting, you know, take their defenses down, just make them hear you. I mean, if you're angry all the time and screaming and yelling all the time, they don't hear you anymore. They just shut you out and they get more defensive. So just try to keep, telling them how much you appreciate the positive things and what about this I just thought of this last night what do you think about that <laughs> um, and then sort of slowly push your way to get what you need for your child that was really important and I have to say each team that we transitioned to was just just better and better and better Palatine High School it was like they rolled the red carpet out what what else what else do you need what else do you need more we're like, what? What was that? <laughs> um, okay. So Palestine High School was wonderful. He was in the life and learning program there um, through his junior year. And his junior year, he started expressing um, that he did not want to be in that program anymore. So we said, okay. Senior year, he was. we pulled him out of the program but still surrounded him with resource. Um, and this whole time up to this point, we just keep – kept being able to pull back on services, pull back on speech therapy, pull back on – so he was sort of, 
I guess the transitioning out of the need for those services. Um, so he didn't, Sam is um, uh, more, uh, let's see, how do I put it? He was able to get a driver's license. Um, he went through driver's ed. Um, again, it's about your team. I mean, I just happened to run into a neighbor who was a special ed teacher um, in the North Shore, but who taught autis autistic um, teenagers how to drive. He was my neighbor. So he was working for one of the local driving schools. That was perfect. We put Sam in there, and then he drove with our neighbor all the time. He ended up getting his license. Um, and he's actually a pretty good driver. He tails people, but <laughs> still working on that one. Um, and then from there, had another person in our neighborhood who was starting a restaurant um, and gave Sam a job. And so it's, it's finding these caring, open-minded people to, you know, give your kid a shot. You know, give, and then you learn so much more about their abilities and, and what they what we need to work on. Um, so from there, Sam didn't really qualify for um, the ATP program. Um, academically, it has no learning disabilities. Um, it's really by the time he was a senior, his biggest issue was social. Not a social person. Um, he will be socially appropriate. He, you may have a conversation with him and think, wow, you know, he has autism. Like, you know, you may, you may not see that right up front, but his language is rote. He does like to talk about certain things and, and only those things until he's done talking about them. Um, but he, he can be very socially appropriate. He does not seek out social um, friendships. He doesn't seek it out at all, and he seems very content with that. We pushed him, pushed him, pushed him, pushed him, pushed the social thing for years, which, you know, and finally we're like, he's happy. <laughs> we're just let it be for now, and as he gets older, maybe he'll discover for himself that those needs, that he has those needs and, and how to act on them, and we'll be there to help him through that. Um, so, uh, he graduated from Palatine High School and d and went to Harper. And again, the the team at Harper, the disabilities office there, wonderful, um, very open to giving Sam whatever accommodations he needed to be successful. Um, so and then. Also during this process, and I have to say it started with his inclusion specialist at his elementary school when we changed him out of the autism program to inclusion. They began in third grade teaching him how to advocate for himself. Um, and and that was really, that's such a great skill when you have a child who does have awareness of their disability, who is verbal, who can communicate that with their needs. That advocacy piece is huge as they age. Um, so that was a very important thing that was really worked on all the way through high school. When he got to Harper, they, the same thing. Now that you're here, Sam, you have to talk to your professor about your disability. You have to let them know um, that you have these accommodations. And you have to work with your teachers on how those accommodations are going to work in that specific classroom. Maybe they. Maybe they want you to um, take a test with everybody else, not go to the testing center. Or maybe they want you to take the professor's notes and not have a note taker in the class. Whatever your accommodations, you have to work that out with your teacher. And it was, a, it was nice because, they again, it was that baptism by fire. Here's what we expect of you, Sam, but we're here if you need us. You know, if, you, if you're having trouble with that professor, we're here if you need it. So um, that, was, it, that was great. Just keep having him put one foot into more and more accountability, more and more responsibility, um, and advocacy for himself. So he started with Harper in the fall of 2013 um, and, and did well. Um, and he then, it was, you know, coming, he was taking all these classes and he still had no idea what he wanted to do. Um, and then I went on a trip to New York, came back and told him about this person I just talked to about, uh, they, they do, they, their job is archiving. And archiving is this up and coming, just for everybody, this is great for autistic people, if you have a child with autism, um, archiving is this sort of, it's an archaic profession, but it's on the cusp now of, of really big time job growth because everybody is archiving their histories and their libraries and their every moment on the internet and and and, and they want they you know 
Fortune 500 companies have archiving departments and all the local governments have archiving departments like you need to stay current and have all this stuff from the past um, uploaded to the internet so I was telling him about that and he's like that's that's it that's what I want to do I want to do oh and to say something else he did always want to be a history major he loved history and we my husband and I are like well what do you want to do with history I don't know I don't know I don't want to teach, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. So we're, we kind of tried to steer him in a different direction, a different major. <laughs> um, that came back to haunt us. Um, so, but when he was really excited about this archiving um, job, and he went online and he looked at different colleges that offered archiving um, as a major, as a discipline. Um, unfortunately, there's there are no, there aren't, many undergrad programs in that. It's a graduate program, but we he did find that two universities in the Midwest, Western University, Western Michigan and uh, University of Northern Iowa, offered an undergrad public history archiving program. So behind our back, he went and applied to Western Michigan. We had no idea. <laughs> Paid the fee, got his transcripts transferred, the whole thing. Came down one day, late November, and showed us his acceptance letter to, the West, to Western Michigan and to this archiving program. We're like, to transfer in January, mind you. We're like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. So we had to sit down and have a really long conversation about why do you want to do it? You know, what happens if you can't find a job? What ha you know, and it all, when everything was said and done, we said, so really, is your, how, what's your passion level? Do you still want to do this? He goes, not really. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so yes, he is verbal, but he doesn't communicate very well. So um, anyway. So we had him continue at Harper, um, and he actually ended up, he's just he just finished in December his seventh semester at Harper. Um, we had him go an extra um, semester, another, it was just one semester at a time. Take these classes, try this, do that, you know. Um, and finally, it came around where he just really wanted to be a history major. And we're like, oh my gosh, let's just get him a degree. Let's <laughs> fine. Where, where should we go? Um, so believe it or not, this coming Sunday, he is transferring to the University of Illinois. That's our biggest transition yet. Um, he is, thank you. <laughs> um, we're so proud of him. He has come so far. And um, I again, the University of Illinois, like many universities have um, disability departments, but I, my experience with the University of Illinois so far has been incredible. Um, they, again, it's just what, you know, they kind of roll out the carpet for you. What can we do for you? How can we help you? How can we make you successful here? And so we've had several meetings. It's called the DRES office, Department of um, Rehabil yeah. Resource Rehabilitation and Educational Services or something. Um, it's called the DRES office. I have so much on my mind, I can't think of acronyms. But um, so we've had many uh, meetings and conversations with the DRES office on how to make his time there more successful. The housing department, um, when I first, when he first got into Illinois, I called the housing department and, and I said, here's what's happening. We have a child with autism coming down. We really need him to have a single room. Um, he's like, okay, first go back to the DRES office, get registered with the DRES office. Once you're that, then the, the you know, handcuffs come off for us and we can, create magic we can try to make something perfect for him um, and they did and so the so Sam's got a single room right next to the RA in a dorm um, even though he's 21 University of Illinois with any transfer students that have never lived in a dorm you have to live in a dorm which was a lifesaver because Sam was convinced he was living in an apartment and so that was a battle we didn't have to fight because the university told him nope you're in a dorm so um, He's still, so he has these, you know, he knows he's 21. He also has a brother who's a freshman at University of Iowa. And I think what happened is he watched his brother go through the process of, tr of transitioning to college and everything he had to do, and he wanted to be just like that. And so he has these things in his mind where, well, I'm older, so I should be in an apartment at a dorm, or I'm this, and, you know. Um, and so we don't want to treat him younger. We don't treat, treat him less than, but we have to be, we, it's a balancing act on, how much to push, how much to pull back, how much to fight. Um, so anyway, um, the disabilities office is incredible. They are surrounding him with whatever accommodations he needs. And again, it's that advocacy piece where he needs to be um, 
speaking with the professors, but together they write a letter, and that letter goes to all his professors, and he has to sit down with each professor and talk about those accommodations and how they need to work for him in each specific classroom. Um, what's also wonderful about that disabilities office is that you know Sam can go there for any support he needs, any type of counseling and coaching he needs. Um, that office, um, which I think is fantastic, is one of the um, largest draws of corporations and companies throughout the country that want to hire people with disabilities. Um, so um, they, you know, Microsoft comes in and, and um, all these companies come in and we, we want to talk to your, you know, we want to talk to your disability population. How can we get them employed? What can we do? Um, internships as well. Like it's just this wonderful opportunity that I never knew existed because it's always like what's next you know okay he can take classes but then what how he's not really going to interview well so how what kind of job is he going to have and um, <clears throat> the disabilities office has assured us that they'll they're going to train him and coach him and get him ready and bring these companies in that already want people like him so Hopefully his future is bright. I am um, freaking out <laughs> that I can't be in control. Um, but it's okay. I mean, I, I've always wanted a day like this to happen, but now that it's here, I'm literally a mess. But um, I have to say, in one of the disability meetings, one of the address meetings, Sam was talking about his accommodations that he was using at Harper, and it made me so proud, shocked and proud that he was also talking about accommodations that I never even knew he had. He had got them for himself. So that again, that advocacy piece is really huge. If just keep pushing these kids to, to be proud of who they are, own what they can do, and, um, and surround themselves take that action themselves to surround themselves with supports because they're there for them. So that's my story. Thank you. I'm Joan Martin, and um, I have visuals. So um, should I get this little? No, no, no. I think maybe I need the little clicker. Like Mickey, I'm, I'm a lucky duck parent. I have two kids with uh, developmental disabilities. Um, and... I thought that I would bring a little positive influence to our falling off the cliff this morning because, um, you know, I uh, live in uh, Glenview and um, I always thought, heck, you know, I invested a lot of time and energy and <clears throat> family resources to their education. and. I was not going to let the end feel like a defeat. And um, so I just thought this, this picture was going to inspire us all to think a little bit more about the end as being something positive than, than that falling off the cliff. So let's think a little bit more about the gliding through transition than, than the cliff fall, because I have no idea what a cliff fall feels like, and this scares me to death too. But, but maybe, maybe, you know, it's a, a little bit more positive in thinking about that. So um, um, two kids, yeah. So I, I come to um, this group uh, similar to the way your group has been formed. Um, I'm a founding member of a group called Total Link to Community, and uh, similar to uh, this group, um, we were a group of moms that got together and said, well, we want our kids to, to continue to stay in the community, and um, so we wanted them to have lives that were rich, just like their high school education, and so we got together and um, said, let's continue to talk amongst our community to make things like this happen. So I applaud you all for, for doing this kind of thing too. So um, um, I wanted to survive the, the public school education, like I said. So um, let me move to the next slide so you can see my kids. Jesse, she's 30. And um, this is Brian, he's 25. After Jesse was born, you know, I waited that five years and schlepped her around to a million uh, therapies because, you know, God knows you didn't want anything bad to happen again. <laughs> but um, I'm going to focus today a little bit um, not on the 
bringing the two of them up, but more a little bit about um, what went on in the transition between like high school and thereafter. Because um, I grew up um, and so did um, their dad, my former husband, in, in lives of microenterprise entrepreneurship, um, owning our own businesses from generations back. And that was the way we knew about uh, employment. Everybody in our families owned their own businesses, and maybe they came off the boat figuring that out, I don't know, but it was our solution to employment. So when um, our kids were going through school, um, it was to me kind of like the way of thinking, well, heck, who's gonna hire these kids? And it was also a way for me to think about um, a safeguard a little bit against the public. You know, in a way, it was like it was another hug around them. Like, uh, if if we have our own business, well, nobody's going to fire them either, right? You know, <laughs> they own their own business. It was going to be a way for them to empower themselves with their own dreams and hopes. You know, the American dream kind of thing. But it was also a protection against the reality that they were really significantly disabled. You know took off those rosy colored glasses and said, these kids had AIDS their whole life. <laughs> they went to public and private schools, but they had, from preschool on, you know, pretty significant needs. And um, it was a time in their lives when I had to realize, you know, Jesse was um, non-ambulatory, could only use part of her body, was dependent on, you know, someone taking her to the bathroom all the time, someone to write for her. She's a, a very strong verbal advocate for what she needed, but was the world really ready to hire her for paid employment? Hmm. You know, it was a really, high school was a time that I started really thinking about those kinds of things. And, you know, I really wish I had started thinking about those things earlier. And maybe some of you are here in the audience of kids who are younger, but you're here because you're thinking about these things. And so um, um, high school was really that time and mostly towards the end of high school, I will have to admit. Um, but I, I thought that the kids both needed to be employed. They needed to have a meaningful life um, but I, I really didn't think that the world was necessarily ready to employ them. And um, so today, um, both kids are business owners. They both have part-time jobs. Um, and um, I'm going to really focus a little bit today more on Brian's job, because in the, in, the, in the sake of time, um, Brian has a business called... Um, hardback yo-yo, and I have some things up here to show you a little bit about what Brian does. And he repurposes um, library books into all kinds of um, items that he manufactures in our home. And, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how he created it and how we sustain it as a family and as a community. So here we go. This is a, a picture of Brian at a show that we had at a, at a bar that started at um, like 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening till 11 o'clock at night that was extremely difficult for him this year. But it was a chance to try something different. It was a late, late, late night craft show. But you know, you got to stretch and try new things all the time. And this is Brian in front of Lou Malnati's corporate office in Northbrook. It's about five miles from our house. And Brian does filing um, of their weekly receipts from all the different pizzerias. And he also helps them. They give a, 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 um, an office, you know, the people that work in the office, they get a free lunch on Friday of all the Lou Malnati's food. And he works in the kitchen begrudgingly and uh, cleans up and puts out the lunch and cleans it up too as part of his little part-time job. So together, these two uh, jobs are what Brian does for employment. 
We started Brian's business when he was 18 years old, when we came to his last transition meeting, I mean his meeting right before transition, and the head of his um, uh, uh, school program announced to him that he, he was going to be starting transition. It was going to include uh, work and school for the next year, but showed him a picture from the front of Time magazine that showed him that we were in a very interesting time and that there really were not very many jobs available. Bum bum. <laughs> so I was like, well, what does that mean? You know, you're going to be needing a job next year. So I immediately went into the overdrive where that thing clicked into me about, well, well let's start him a job then, you know. So that's when um, I'm a a real big crafty lover person and I went to the renegade craft fair that summer between school and uh, ending and starting again in the fall and I was noticing where all the people were hanging out and this was one of the booths was somebody was doing something similar to this and we gave the teachers gifts similar to this one year and um, everyone was like "Ooh, that's so cool that's so cool and part of the thing that I was saying was you have to have a business that people think is neat or cool, not like, oh, we feel sorry for you, so we're going to buy it, right? We didn't want that because I didn't think that Brian even had the capacity to talk about um, feeling sorry for himself, really. I, think, I thought he needed to have a business where people would talk about the product, which is, you know, that's part of discovery. That's part of sharing what's important about the product. So um, part of um, having a business is, you know, it's got to be something that sells on its own merits. So during that time, I thought um, we need to utilize as much of the supports that we possibly can. And that's the perfect time in transition is to say, Brian has a lot of supports around him. At that time, he was having even a one-to-one -one aid. So um, during transition time, he had behavioral therapists. He had a one-to-one -one aid. And part of that tricky time was also including those people to understand what business was about. Because those pe people that were working with him in the school district thought, they kind of got their feathers ruffled a little bit because they weren't really comfortable in supporting business. So it was also important for us to explain that um, they could do what they were most comfortable doing. And it was important for us not to push the envelope to ask people in school to do things that were not comfortable for them. It was like um, one of the women brought up up here. You, you, you do things that people are most comfortable. I think I, I think we talked about it right here. You ask the neighbor, right, who's owning a um, a restaurant, to help your son get a job in the restaurant, right? You don't. Um, you ask your accountant to help you with your accounting. You don't ask the accountant to help you do the logo for your business. <laughs> We asked Aunt Sherry to help us with the logo for our business, who is a graphic designer. So um, during that time in transition, it was important for us to think a lot about how to help people um, who were doing things in their own wheelhouse to support Brian in that business. Okay. So I thought, hmm. We can't really think about this on a year-to-year -year basis, and I think this is a lot of reflective thinking even after the fact is, what do we want to get out of this? You know, where are we trying to go with this? And the funniest thing is, as this came up today, is Brian always wanted to be an archivist. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was like, this is really funny, and we, he always said that word so perfectly. <laughs> so during the time while he was in transition, it was really important. Both he and Jesse got their associate's degree. And so we thought, well, what kind of associate degree could you possibly get during school? So he got an associate degree in library technical assistance at the College of Lake County, and he was supported 
during his school years by the staff in school. And um, it was very funny because we thought, well, how do we combine the passion that he had for books and, and studying um, the history of things and, and the, the dates of movies? And he just, he was a sieve for information. So um, this business that we helped to start for him kind of parlayed all that information because um, he was so comfortable being in the library. He loved information. And we kind of just kept bringing all that in. And um, so um, we, we, we brought all of the information together. But we said the most important thing was that we looked far beyond each year as we were going through transition. And we said, what do we want to get out of this in the end? And we don't want to just say year to year. We want to say, in the end, when we're finished with all of this, what's the most important thing? And we wanted, of course, as we all do, we want our kids to be happy, but we want them to have something that sustains, something that, and, and, but we didn't want it to be a sustained thing that, oh, this is the only job you're going to have for the rest of your life, but just that it's a stepping stone. You know, we, we had to allow for the fact that he still was only 18, 20, 22, now he's 25. If he changes his mind tomorrow, it's still okay. It's a career. I mean, like we have all heard a million times before, these are not the only jobs our kids are going to ever have. And like Mickey said, how many times in different stores her kids have, have been to, and they've learned things along the way. So, um, um, the goal setting that we thought about was um, this was the most important thing and it really was shocking to, um, to some of our teachers was that I came in and said that I wanted um, Brian to be Medicare eligible by the time that he graduated from high school. And a lot of our teachers were not familiar with um, financial things. And, things having to do with Social Security and Medicare. And like I said, this was some time ago, and I don't know what your transition teachers know about today, but I hope that they're coming with you to some of these seminars and things and invite them to come when Sherry Schneider comes, bring a buddy teacher with you so that they're learning things about this. But I had um, bad insurance. Um, I have diabetes, the kids have disabilities, and you know, insurance has changed over the time, but I had like iChips insurance. And I knew that M Medicaid was not the insurance that I wanted my kids to have for, for the entirety of their life. So when I explained to the teachers that the goal for Brian's transition was that I wanted him to be a wage earner, I wanted him to pay taxes, and I wanted him to be Medicare eligible. And if you guys don't know what that means, then during these next seminars, ask a lot of questions that um, I wanted him to um, pay in to his FICA um, by the time he was leaving transition so that he could be eligible for Medicare insurance. Um, I also wanted um, him to have access to most reliable and economical transportation. Um, school was giving him taxi cabs everywhere, and I was thinking, holy camoly, I know we cannot afford that. Even just going around town, uh, the cost of a taxi cab was so very expensive. Um, I knew that we needed to work on skills um, to get him support that school was paying for, speech therapy, these um, emotional therapy, even though we were having therapy outside of school. But I was looking at the investment that school was paying to educate Brian all the way through school. And when that glide was going to take place after school, I was thinking the onus was on us as a family to take that on unless that was a true transition. And that the goal was to be saying, how do we really make that seamless by saying he either doesn't need those services anymore or that there is a complete handoff to other professionals that I could afford, Brian could afford to pay for by his own income, or that we change the way we were receiving the services so that we were more economically stable 
in that transition because I was looking at that education as being just gold and that's why I picked to live where I was, that I was getting everything that we wanted. Um, and um, we were just continually um, changing that focus as we were moving along until graduation. So I don't know if any of you think about this, but I started to think about that, that, that those IEPs that we were going to year after year after year were really part giving us um, useful discovery information. And um, they would tell us things that we needed to know to create what employment was going to look like for Brian. And I thought that they were going to be telling us um, skill preferences, um, things that Brian really loved to do. Like I knew that he, of course, like a lot of young men that have autism, that he loved his video games. Um, his pre present level of performance, this is where, again, I took off those rosy glasses and I said, let's be honest, um, he was, you know, a really smart guy, but we all have smart kids, right? And, but he was still in special education his whole entire life. I mean, I couldn't deny that, right? He was getting a lot of services, and his peers were all heading off to four-year universities. We were in that little stinking 3%. And so that little stinking 3% in our area um, is a pretty small percent of people. <laughs> and and where, I, where I'm living, that's a very, very small percent of people that um, need a lot of specialized services. So I had to think, his peer group was very, very small. Um, his career test, uh, skill testing said that Brian was a very good salesman. And I thought, hmm, what can we do about those salesman <laughs> skills? Yeah, he could, he could talk you in and out of anything. Um, how did Brian work as a team? Not that well, not very well at all. Um, his speech and language abilities um, for working in customer service were, to be honest, I think a lot of kids with special needs are put in customer service type positions, and I didn't think Brian was the face of many businesses at all. I think he's a little snarky, he's um, a little rough around the edges, and I don't think he knows it, to be honest. Um, his physical ability and limitations, um, he's strong, he's capable, and actually he needed a lot of that physical work to help stabilize his um, sensory needs. Um, his cognitive abilities and limitations, I think, is what he had going for him. I think he, um, his, he, he didn't really have a lot of learning disabilities, and he's sharp with math. He can do a lot of calculations in his head. He had a great memory um, for details. And I think that part of the transportations and needs and accommodations were he didn't want to drive. He clearly said, it makes me nervous, it makes me anxious. So we had to you know, move that into the plan. And again, I felt that I still was in my mind going, he's young and he's a boy. You know, he, he's, he's still growing. And I wanted to move that hopes, dreams, and wants and desires in. And like we talked about, they don't know. They just, a lot of the young, young adults don't know what they want to do. And it's hard to ask that direct question, except for the fact that he said he wanted to be an archivist. And when we looked it up, it required like a gazillion years of, of you know, or even to be, even to be um, someone who works in a library, we said, oh my God, you're going to need so many years of education. And we didn't even know if he could sit through a college class yet at that point to then have a master's degree and whatever. So, um, and, and who was gonna help him to, to um, achieve his goals? Sometimes in the IEP we, we talk about all those steps along the way. Okay. So we decided it was really important because I had worked a lot of years in person-centered planning and was a true believer in it. And I said, we are going to utilize some of these skills and we did path planning for the kids, and we said we are always going to keep assessing um, and keep revisiting um, what are the hopes, the dreams, the and how are we going to make it happen. Here's what we decided. Brian loves books. 
He can rattle off all kinds of information. He knows when things are published. His favorite pastimes is trivia. He collects movies and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, he needed help with work ethics. His energy level was kind of low. He still needed help around speech and language. Um, he was a great salesperson. He could do math computations in his head. Um, he's capable of learning the credit card machine and all that. Um, we knew we could learn to work independently, but he preferred to work by himself. We noticed that he liked to sing and watch movies and do all those kinds of things. Um, he does a lot of humming. Um, so we created a workshop in our house um, where he, we, we made the work environment suit exactly to his strengths. And we um, only had him do the things that we thought he could do best. But then he really grew into um, his, his strengths as the business started to grow. So I'll give you a, a, an example. Um, this last piece here is important to know about um, how the transition team worked with Brian during school. His one-to-one -one aid came with him when we did some shows and, and worked with him as a coach. Um, they, his um, speech and language um, pathologist helped coach him with how do you approach a customer? Do you, you know, you can't have your hands in your pants, you know, you know those kinds of things. She talked to him about different kinds of ways to read other people's faces, um, that personal space. So we used um, PS, we used little code words, like when he's too close to a customer. Like we created things that he was already using, but we used them in the environment of work. And um, so, we used things that we would use in the classroom or all kinds of places, but then we just transformed them into the work environment. But um, just to give you an idea of over four or five years of time, you know, the first time we, we had a show, it was at, um, I think, a synagogue, like a ladies' um, bazaar. After two hours, he was like under the table, kind of yelling and screaming, I got to get out of here. Now, we can drive to Effingham for the transition conference. We can get there late at night, unpack all of the things. Brian, um, well, before we even go, he knows exactly what to put in the car. He can go through a checklist, make sure he's gone to the bank prior to the show, and make sure he has just the right amount of change in the cash register. Um, he knows what boxes to fill uh, and how much a product for who is the desired audience. He knows that women teachers like certain kinds of thing, his favorite audience. Um, no offense to the males, but he knows what the women like. Um, he knows exactly, goes through a checklist of what things need to be in the car. He puts the hep, does the heavy lifting, it's hard for my back. He knows exactly the stands, the setup, what the table's going to look like. He asked me how big the space is going to be. Are we going to get a six-foot table, an eight-foot table? He prints out a thing about who his contact people are, who, who we're going to talk to at the show, how long it's going to take us to get there, you know, the whole pre-thing. We can arrive at 5, 6 o'clock at night. We'll unload the space, even set it up. Wake up the next morning, oftentimes we have to be set up and ready to go by 8 in the morning for a show. He'll set up the whole entire thing with just my supervision or just talking through things and sustain an 8 or 10 hour show. Now, when a lot of people aren't coming in, yes, he takes a break. Sometimes he'll lay on the floor where nobody's watching him if it's appropriate, and be on his computer, watching a video game, doing what he needs to do, it's okay. It's okay, because he knows when it's time. He can say when he needs a break. But we could also pack the whole thing up and drive home for three hours, too. So there, over this course of time, 
he has grown at his pace. And, and we've seen it. So this was our biggest goal. And both Jesse and Brian reached it. And I think that, um, unfortunately, um, I think a lot of students spend a lot of time training for work in high school. And we dove right in because it was important to us to make money in high school. There's a lot of incentives to help people who, who are earning Social Security um, to make a lot of money while you're a full-time student. And it's a, a little hidden Social Security incentive. And that is the best and easiest time to make the most money you can. And it's while you are a full-time student. And for many people, that cuts off when you're 18. For a few more people, it cuts off when you're 22. But you can earn the most money without your benefits decreasing. And it's the best time to earn your Medicare credits that will be a gift for your sons and daughters to have Medicare insurance for the rest of their lives. And that's something that I, I entrust on you to research if you think your sons or daughters can or cannot, you know, if you think they could be a wage earner. This was a passion um, for me and um, helping Brian and Jesse both um, have self-employment was a flexible way and I want to en enforce flexible because um, being um, self-employed is a very flexible way to be a wage earner where you can control a lot of the variables. Um, so these are some of the supports. Brian had a pass plan during school. Um, he now has a home base waiver. He has typical business expenses like deductions. We can use unincurred business expenses. These are all big, huge words, but if you want to write them down or, or use them. Um, he has his job at Total, um, he has a job coach through Total Link to Community. Um, he has volunteers that have helped him get an Etsy site going. Um, he has donated services from family and friends that helped him build a website, um, a beautiful business card and all kinds of other things that we ask people who are good at it, someone who um, does websites for a living, donated services. I implore you to only ask people who do things in their own wheelhouse to help your sons and daughters. Then it's not pity giving, it's giving because they want to. Um, get, take, up. Oh, I wrote advise. Take advice from everyone. Everyone will want to give you advice. Debbie, thank you. And um, teachers, one-on-one -on -one aides during transition, take everything you possibly can from those services while you're in transition. It is their job. It is their job to give you support in anything that is supposed to help you be as best as you can when you exit. You might not think so, but it is. And um, let's see what else. OK. Be in touch if you have questions, you want to shop. Um, I'm a good life designer. If you need help, I can do that. Jessie is a public speaker, a community mentor. She's a dancer and a choreographer. And here's a little information about Brian's business. You can find him on Etsy. And thank you very much. <laughs>